just one moment. Okay, we are live on Facebook. Very cool. All right. All right. We are going to get started. If the other ones join us, that will be wonderful. And we're going to get started now. We have um, with us Janet Bentley. And Janet is from Scottsdale, Arizona. She's passionate about championing, championing the needs of children and spreading hope for survivors. She's represented four C's at the Stand for Children rally in Washington, um, D.C., which was the largest public demonstration in U.S. history in support of children. She's registered at the Speakers Bureau um, member for RAIN, which is Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network. She is a founder of her own nonprofit called Show Up for Children. So welcome, Janet. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Cheryl Ann. And Cheryl Ann, in her bio, she says that she went, grew up very painfully shy and in a home where little girls were to be seen and not heard. And so um, she has been, she, she's best known, she is an award-winning artist and a speaker, and she's best known for her beautiful woman project, a project designed to empower women and girls to break the stories that are untold. Welcome, Cheryl. All right, we have Michelle, would you give us a little bio on you? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Michelle Croswell. I am a native New Yorker currently residing in Florida. Uh, I have been a mentor for children for over 30 plus years, mentoring in juvenile um, detention facilities as a foster parent, as a mom, as an auntie, as a role model, as a child investigator. So um, mentoring children is, is my forte. I also do a lot of volunteer work in within the country and outside of the country. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Shannon, would you tell us about you? Um, yes, I'm I'm a filmmaker. I live in Australia. Um, I'm also a songwriter, and um, basically my experiences I, I put into my work. She has. She's an uh, an author as well. Yes, awesome. And what was the, what's the name of your book? It's um, the blood on my hands. The blood on my hands. It was quite a touching story. Um, and Shana, would you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Shana. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I was having a hard time at first. Um, I'm Shana. I'm a survivor. I have breaking my own uh, silence and come and uh, came out of shadows within the last few years myself. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm an advocate for speaking out. I don't know what else you want me to say. I'm really happy to be here. We're happy you're here too. And, and Carmel, um, she is from originally from Dublin, Ireland. She now currently lives in California. She has a BA in natural sciences and works is working towards her MA in communication studies and she also has a small public speaking and paper speech paper editing business very good welcome ladies well this is what this is in behalf of we the woman I love and we choose to thrive I'm happy that we're all here before to set the tone of this interview I want to read a couple a little quote some quotes that mean a lot to me to set the tone this is one from one of my very favorite speakers, authors, um, it's from Brene Brown. It says, I do not owe my past a place in my future. The irony is that we attempt to disown our difficult stories to appear more whole or more acceptable. But our wholeness, even our wholeheartedness, depends on the integration of all of our experiences, including our faults. And that's where we are today, and that's why we are come together to share the message of hope and inspiration to other abuse survivors that that we can thrive, we can be happy, and we can do well. And welcome to each one of you, and thank you for taking the time and being sharing a chapter with in in the book we choose to thrive, but also to be here for this interview. One of the Marianne Williams says that our deepest fear is that we are inadequate. 
but we are much, we are so powerful. And joining together like this makes us even more powerful. So our first question today, and I would like to start with you, Cheryl Ann. Okay. Our first question today is what prompted you to share your story with in this We Choose to Thrive book? I've been sharing my story for a number of years now. And when I first started sharing it, I was sharing it inappropriately. I would just have to get it out of me. And it took me a while to figure out that wasn't helpful for me and it wasn't helpful for those who had to hear it. So after a lot of work, a lot of treatment, I realized then there is a place to share it. And for me, it's been from the stage, it's through my art, it's in my videos. And so it was sort of a natural progression. I mean, this has been 20 years on when I finally met you and you were pulling this book together. It was so natural for me that yes, now I have a way of sharing my story that can empower and not trigger. And it's one of those things where when we do share it in an appropriate way, it makes a big difference, not just for those who initially hear it, but for those whispers that continue to go on. Very good, thank you. Janet, what, what inspired you to share in this project? Well, I was introduced to you through Rain, um, a member of the Speakers Bureau. Um, and after we talked about the project that you were undertaking, um, I was at, actually in awe of it, um, that helping the abuse survivors. Um, it was right where I was in my healing process. I had only just begun to publicly share some of my story. Um, I had written my book, but it's, it's, not, it's not public yet. Um, and mostly I just feel like I want other survivors to have hope that no matter what they've been through, that it's possible to heal. Um, I also want this, I want to help be a, a part of a change so that this subject is not as taboo as it has been, so that it can be talked about. Um, sometimes I use the example of cancer. Um, I, I actually am a cancer survivor, but cancer used to be the C word. You know, nobody would talk about it. And that's kind of, um, I'm hoping we can lose that taboo with the sexual abuse as well. Very good, thank you. Hi, Nikki, welcome. Hi, thank you. All right. Um, Michelle, would you like to share what prompted you to share, to take part in this project? I surely would. Just as Janet, I am a speaker for the organization RAIN, Rape Abuse Incest National Network. I received an email that uh, yourself, you were looking for some women to speak about their uh, issues or the problems or the abuse that they encountered. And of course, I being with RAIN as a counselor and a speaker, uh, I wrote a book over 12 years ago. It was called Don't Run Away, Make Away Queen. And I don't know if you can see it. It's about my life, uh, what I've encountered, the sexual abuse I encountered. And it took me years to come out about what happened to me because it's not something, as Janice said, it's a taboo subject. But I felt it necessary because at the time when I wrote the book, Oprah Winfrey had just came out with her story. And because of the type of work I was performing at that time, I was New York's finest, a police officer. I couldn't tell anybody what I had encountered. Even though I wasn't embarrassed as to what happened, I don't think society would have been ready to hear my story as a police officer who had been sexually abused as a child. I don't think they would have been ready for that. So when I learned of you wanting to have people to speak about it, I said, of course, I've been mentoring, especially women and children of abuse. Why not? Why should I not join with the rest of the women? Very good, and we're happy you did. Thank you. Carmel, would you like to share? I too had been in touch with you through Rain, and I had wanted to come out with my story for quite a while. I just didn't have the right outlet, and I wanted to help others rather than just tell my story. I wanted to tell my story and for that story to have an effect on others and perhaps help them. So this project just seemed like the perfect way to do that. I've seen so much growth and change out of you know, through all of us that we've been able to support each other. Um, you know, we have the Facebook group too, and there's been some pretty amazing stuff happening. So thank you. Shannon. 
Um, yes, um, I was introduced to you. Um, I'm kind of a fledgling at all this. I, my, I've talked about my story for years and years, but not made it public per se. My, my family know and other people know that are close to me. So um, it's kind of been a bit of a traumatic ride, but now I'm just, I've come into your group and I've, I've decided, yes, um, it's good that people share their stories because it, it does empower people. And, and I suppose I'm like everyone else in this panel. Um, you know, if you help one person, I think that it's all worth it. Very much. When I first wrote my book, I said, I had no idea the impact it would have. And I felt when I published it, that if it helped one person, I'd be satisfied. And, right. and in the few months since I've published my story, it's my life has just transformed. It's just gone crazy. So, um, Shauna, would you share? Well, I think like the rest of us, um, I felt compelled to share my story because so many other people have come to me, men and women. Um, I have shared my story with people throughout my life, um, not till I was older. But in doing that, I realized the impact that my story did have and my in what I thought in my beginning healing journey, the impact that I had on people was, um, I kind of think they reflected a light within myself. I did not see the light that they saw within myself, but when I started the healing process, they saw something and I had so many people come to me and ask me, how did you do this? How can you help me? I need to be in your light, show me. And throughout that, it really, it was, it was quite the process. It took me many years uh, for all this to really sink in, but I realized the impact that I did have with people and finally speaking and doing my own thing with this, I realized I needed to break my silence in a bigger way. And when you came to me and asked me to do uh, this book, I was so thrilled because like I, like I told you, this is something that I thought was your book idea is something that I had thought of many years ago, but didn't know how to go about it. And when you came to me with this book idea, I thought, oh, my God, you have <laughs> such a movement here, my dear. And I'm so honored and thankful to be a part of it because I think it's huge. And I don't want to get emotional, but it is emotional. <laughs> and this is why I'm here. This is why I'm sharing my story, you know, because I know um, with breaking that silence, it does have an impact on other people. And it you does. can heal from this. You can it has got to be strong and got to stick with it. It's all a choice, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Nikki, you, um, you weren't here for the earlier introductions. Would you like to tell a little bit about yourself and then um, answer the question as to what prompted you to share the story with you, We Choose to Thrive? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, everyone. My name is Nikki DeBose, and I actually wasn't here because I was being on a bill to help prevent child sexual abuse. So it's really important to me. These issues are so important. Um, and I was so delighted that Becky actually be part of the book. Um, she's an incredible person. I actually met Becky when I was um, published my last book, um, Washed Away from Darkness, to talk about child sexual abuse and how that affected my mental illness. Um, abuse in the modeling industry. So I'm really excited to be a part of We Choose to Thrive. Um, one of my main messages when I go out in the public and speak, um, when I go to the legislature, you know, and, and bring mental health to the forefront, um, is that abuse affects every area of our lives <laughs> and that we need to take it very seriously. We need to help prevent it. Um, we need to support others who are going through it. Um, and we need to educate the world about abuse in all forms. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. And I'm so happy to be here. In your we're, we're so happy you're here too. And that's one of the things that I never understood before that abuse is abuse. It doesn't matter what kind of abuse. And no. there is no way to measure how it affects the person. Absolutely. Each one, it's so deeply personal. Yeah. For. So the next question is, in the process of your own healing, what has been your greatest obstacle? We'll start with you, Janet. Um, I would have to say the biggest obstacle 
to my healing was myself. Um, not for it to be a cliche, but um, when I looked in the mirror, um, I saw a dirty, ugly, damaged beyond repair little girl um, that I was conditioned to believe I was from a very young age. Um, I did not think I could ever change that. I, I honestly did not. I didn't think I deserved to live, let alone, you know, begin to heal. Um, I'd been to many therapists, many treatment centers um, from my early 30s. And up until a couple years ago, that had just dealt with, you know, the symptoms of, of the trauma. And um, it kind of came to a head a couple years ago. And with the help of a very supportive husband and some very good therapists at the time, I took a leap of faith and went into the Meadows, which is a trauma treatment center, um, and decided to um, base my trauma head on. Um, I, I did feel that was my last hope. And it yes. worked. <laughs> Your story is, is quite a story. Thank you. Um, Shannon, what was your greatest obstacle to, as you started your, your, your healing journey? Uh, likewise myself, um, because I think the fear, um, just the fear of other people judging you, recriminations, um, things that, the, the what if scenarios, um, that that's that's a huge thing like uh, you always you 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 pre-plan everything in you so that you're prepared for whatever might happen so I suppose my, my biggest fears were um, don't do anything because you're safe where you are <laughs> you just stand still you stand still you're frozen um, so for me to actually even push a publish button for my own book um, it wasn't hard to write the story I've written all my life you know I, I write everything and 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 when I, my bodies of work that I, I produce often have lots of my past in it, but people that might be the audience mightn't realise that. So um, for me, it was that exposure. Um, yeah, I think that whole thing, that was my big fear because it is that whole thing, you're broken and you, and you, you don't, half the time you don't even think you're broken. I'm a workaholic, I just keep going, I'm an automatic pilot. And um, so... It's that whole thing of like your fear is yourself. If you can get over and, and probably reconcile with yourself, you're, you're in a better place. Very good. Thank you. Carmel? I think my biggest obstacle was shame, that I had done something wrong and that, was, that took a lot to overcome because I felt like uh, as a child I should have had the ability to say no. I had no clue until later in life that a child doesn't have that power. That they can say no all they want and it's not going to make any difference. The power is in the hands of the abuser. So it was shame that, again, I, I, it was me. I had done the bad thing. Very good. And Nikki? My biggest obstacle was definitely just myself, um, you know, and, and being bullheaded. And, um, and also I think with mental illness, you know, it really um, – it's a disease in itself because it keeps me from um, getting help and, and being able to understand myself and being able to seek help. Um, so it was myself, but at the same time, it was all the mental illnesses that I, that I had, which there's no shame in that. Well, oftentimes when we've been, at, if we've experienced these kind of things, there's, a lot of repercussions that color everything about our life until we finally get to the place where we decide to do something about it. Yeah, great. Uh, Shauna. Oh, I think that, like the other ladies, it was definitely myself that was my biggest obstacle. Um, I did not learn till later in life. Uh, like I said, my, my abuse was throughout my childhood and it started at a very young age and to me it was normal. It was what was normal to me. Um, and also the protection of my family. I felt in a lot of ways that I had to protect my abuser and protect the people in my family that were close to me, including uh, my perpetrator's uh, wife. And because of that, I suffered greatly. 
um, from holding that silence and all that crap. But my biggest obstacle I realized was definitely myself through this process. And it's been a process, but it's one I've been able to, you know, work through. Um, but it's definitely, um, yeah, that myself, that's all I can say, myself. Myself was my big, big, biggest obstacle. A lot of times if the abuse, especially if it started from childhood, we don't have a whole great barometer of mm -hmm. how to relate otherwise. Um, you know, for some of us, we were told things that we should have never been told. Maybe that yes. we were not smart enough when we were not, you know, we weren't worth much. And so when things like this happen, as we go into adulthood, sometimes it takes us many years to realize the beauty of who we are and step into our own power. Yes, Michelle. absolutely. Michelle. Wow, what a powerful question, um, Becky. Uh, I empathize with each woman on this panel and anyone who has encountered any type of abuse for me. Again, I guess like all the other ladies, uh, I don't want to just say um, the most difficult was getting through the shame of, of blaming myself for what happened. But again, at an early age, I was taught I could, I could not tell. Mm -hmm. And if I did tell, someone would be injured. And God forbid, the one person I told in my childhood, uh, my grandmother, she died the next day. So I carried that all of my life, believing I was at fault for telling someone. So I never told anyone until I was in college in my 30s and the professor had us do a bio, a short story about our life. And that short story started the process of my healing. I thought about myself and I thought nobody else would see this bio. And my professor put it to the side after reading it saying, you have to tell your story. There are so many others like you that need to tell your story and you don't know how you will be helping them. So do not keep it to yourself. So that started along with Oprah coming out. And again, another part of my issue was the type of work that I did, what type of work, uh, and the people would not accept me being someone, a product of child abuse. And because of the statistics in our society that was mentioned that if you were ever abused as a child, that you would become an abuser, which is not true at all. That is not necessarily the truth. That's right. Very much. Cheryl Ann? Yeah, mine's a little bit different in the sense of, um, as you know, I was raised with the rule, little girls should be seen and not heard. So I didn't speak up. I didn't um, know. I knew some of it wasn't normal, but I thought a lot of it was what was going on in every house. But for me, the biggest hurdle was really I was telling people in my art. I was drawing, I was sketching, I was making marks, um, whether I colored in my own dolly or whether I was drawing on every piece of paper. I was telling people. And to me, it was no different than what I do now. I'm standing on the stage and telling people. But it was the lack of understanding from those around me, the lack of um, open-mindedness to actually ask me about my drawing rather than just say, why don't you draw pretty things? And just ask, what does that story say to you? You know, what's this part and who might that be? And for years that went on. So as an award-winning artist now, I look back and think how sad it was that I failed art all the way along because I would be drawing what was inside me and screaming for help in these images. And the, even my, at high school, I failed art because one of the curriculum exams was to draw a jar of candy. And <laughs> a jar of candy was not saying what I wanted it to say. <laughs> so it's not just our own shame and our own fear of being heard or understood or believed, or even believe in all the details ourselves but it's also in the ways that we do tell, because I'm sure in some ways we were all telling what was going on in our behavior, in our movements, in the dress, everything. We're screaming out, hear me, and the lack of understanding in society to interpret those messages that we were and are still sending out. And it's expected now, so long as we say in the written or spoken word, we'll be heard. Not always true, and there's so many other ways to say it too. Very much. I want to acknowledge a question. Um, we have other questions to ask in this interview process, but Susan Platt um, is listening to our webinar and has a question that I want to address for, 
Um, she says, I work in law enforcement in the UK, mainly on serious crime, including sexual offenses. I'm fascinated to know what the barriers were to reporting what was happening to police. Did you consider it at any point? And if you dismissed the idea, why was that? For me, I didn't consider it at all because I was told not only myself, but everybody I loved would be, would be their lives would be taken. I feel, and this is from my point of view, I didn't know that there was help out there. I had no idea. I was too frightened to do anything about it. I just, and, and because we're so ingrained that it's our fault, you know, we kind of that we asked for this kind of treatment for some of us that, and that's what my experience was. I wasn't, I was many years before I realized there's a, a plethora of help. But if I, when in my story, my father just 20 years ago took his life. But even then, when he went missing, after, when he took his life, I went to the police, but I was petrified because I knew that if he was alive still, um, I figured we would all be dead. And I had to get police protection when I did report him missing. So that's, you know, for that, for me, I just was too afraid that it, of what the repercussions would be. Anybody else care to ch chime in on this? Cheryl. Yes, because I saw the question come up and I, it's a great question. I can only share my personal story and it's hard now as somebody who works with people in that way is what to suggest. And so I don't suggest I really make the options available. For me, it was very much about um, not knowing who you could report to. We did have social workers come to speak to me at school because I had a lot of bruising. And all they asked is, is anybody hitting you? And I simply answered no, because it was true. Nobody was hitting me. I wish they'd have asked a few more questions and different questions. But when it comes to realizing I could report to the police, I still to this day have not. And the reason being is that fear of not being believed is so immensely strong. And not just believed, do you believe my story, but do you believe it in the bigger world? And then where is it gonna to have to go? It's gonna to go to a courtroom for strangers to decide who's telling the truth and who's not. And sadly, there's often very little hard evidence that you can say, yes, this happened on this day by this person in this situation and a situation where you can truly and utterly prove it. So for me personally, I do not report it. If I thought that person was still able to hurt others, it may be a different story. Thank you. Anybody else care to comment on Michelle? Well, and that, again, that's a great question. Um, my view started from early ages, from two to 13, by people that were authority figures in my family. Um, I was taught that sex was love. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know that I had to report. I didn't know what was going on was not what was supposed to, what was not normal at the time that it was happening to me. Um, reporting it to the police, that was a no-no because first of all, like you, Becky, uh, I was told if I ever told the story that not only myself would be hurt, but my family would be hurt. I had to protect my family. Um, and by protection is my silence. You know, so I kept silent for a long time. And even with the fact me becoming a police officer years later, um, growing up, there were some issues in, like there are some now, with me growing up being around police officers and some of the officers were not very nice um, to, to children of color. So I put up a barrier. But the main reason for me to become a police officer was because of a combination of things. Because of the barriers I had as a child with police officers, because of the abuse that I encountered, I wanted to mentor children that were and mentor children as well, anyone who was abused. And that's why I became part of the Carmel, the, the noise from the computer is pretty noisy from being moving around. Thank you. I've moved. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to share their viewpoint with Susan? Um, so I would just say, say one quick thing. And it, it, my experience was um, growing up, there was also um, severe domestic violence in my home. 
Um, and I specifically, you know, things were different then. But I remember a time when my mother was beat to almost dying and called the police. And all they said was, you know, you made your bed, you lie in it. Because there wasn't the help or the recognition that, you know, was there. And that, and that made me feel like, why would I tell the police? Like, you know, they, they're, they're not there to help. You know, they didn't help my mom. Right. And it's a different time that we're living in now, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Shannon? Thank God. Um, yeah. Oh, which one was it? Is it me? <laughs> okay. Um, it's hard because there's another Shannon. Shana, I know. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so yes, we went to the police many times, but it wasn't about me. It was the same as Janet. It was about domestic violence issues. Um, and basically the laws back then were a lot different. And they, it was, the answer was, you know, someone's got to be virtually dead before they go out there to, to check up on anything. Um, so the police weren't helpful then. Um, when I was older, I went to the police, but there was um, a big fear of repercussions because um, he was still very active and he w would have come around and hurt my family. So that was just a report, but basically. Um, and f eventually, that's um, the police did an investigation, but it was um, basically getting too late and he died. Right. Right. Anybody else have any one re response back to Susan? I'd just like to add one thing, of course, um, it seems to be a theme here that we're talking about past abuse when we were younger. And so I want to just validate that uh, it's not just something in the past, it's not just that times have changed. Um, the abuse is still happening today to many people. It is. We may have also experienced abuse very recently. And although things have changed in some ways, especially when it comes to reporting, it's in the news every day that a big case comes up where there is evidence and it's still discounted. So I'd like to just, for all those listeners out there, if this is current for you, if it wasn't childhood abuse, if it is happening to you, your feelings are still, you know, we're not talking about the past and oh, well, how wonderful it is today. We are with you today. This is it is, that's very, very true. true. So no matter your age, we're not just talking about childhood abuse. It's all forms of abuse and abuse. Um, as we said before, abuse is abuse. It doesn't matter what the kind of abuse. It's still abuse. And while the awareness is greater today, especially with the authorities, there's still that deep interfere because of just where we are. And the threats are real. You know, and so yeah, and so we, we can... Young, we couldn't say no. It's not about saying no. And it's not that that power struggle has changed one bit, whether I'm older than the abuser even. Right. Power is still in the hands of the abuser. So, sorry, carry on. So let's move this around a little bit into this next question. What's been your greatest aha and reward from sticking with the healing process? We'll start with you, Shana. Mine has been being able to go to a place where I actually feel free. And I know in the first webinar I was listening on, I heard that a lot. And it's so true. Um, I never thought, even though I went through the healing process for many, many years, I never thought I could truly be in a place where I am now, um, in a place where I feel free and I'm actually happy. Um, I've allowed love in my life. It's been an amazing process, a hard process. Um, but my biggest aha moment uh, for me, there was a lot of them. Um, but the biggest one for me recently and that got me here to talking about this was um, I went to LA about a year ago to this women's conference and I met a woman there that approached me and she's this amazing priestess woman and she lit a light she sparked something within me and talking about uh, past lives and she came at me so quick that I had no idea really what she was talking about until later I left that conversation and it really hit me. Um, so throughout my journey I've had many, many, many aha moments um, but I am in a place now where I can say I am pretty happy and I feel 
I'll, you'll never be free. I'll never be healed. This is healing is always a process. It'll be a thing I have to do every single day, but I'm at a place where I can definitely say I have achieved a place I never thought I would. And I'm so happy to be here because when you're in the darkness, you don't always see the light. No, it's true. And I remember many years ago, my therapist said to me, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I remember laughing in her face thinking, yeah, bullshit, you know? Um, but no, there really is light at the end of the tunnel. And one thing I can say is don't quit. Don't ever quit. Like the last lady said, it doesn't matter, you know, if you experience abuse from your past or to present. Very good. Healing is possible and you can get out of it and healing is possible. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> it comes to a lot of times a, a place where you choose, you know, it really you does. To it really does. How about you, Nikki? I'd say um, my greatest aha moment. It, it really, you know, I hear this often. It came out of when my mother passed, and that was kind of like the light that went off for me um, and realizing that things were not right, that I needed to change. Um, and then kind of from there, that's when I was able to get help and come to terms with uh, a lot of the things that I was dealing with and where that all started from, you know, which was the trauma in my childhood. Um, and it was, of course, it was very difficult. It's, you know, it took a few years um but it's been so rewarding you know the process of self-love and self-care and realizing that i deserve to love myself um that i deserve to to take care of myself around myself with positive people with positive places with positive things because for my entire life i was a complete wreck and you know i i wasn't making decisions um, that were healthy, although I thought that they were good. Um, they were a result of my traumatic environment. Um, so, you know, every day I try to do things that bring me back to that healthy place of balance, but it's not easy. Um, and, and I think that as I continue moving forward, I, you know, and, and just trying to keep myself in track with my therapist, um, with healthy people, and, and making sure that the main problem in my life, which has been the trauma, is under control. Very good. Thank you. Carmel? I think my biggest aha was each time I would tell somebody new that it wasn't put back on me, they were supportive, they understood, they assured me, you know, I'm really sorry that happened. And each time would be reassurance that I had done nothing wrong. So the more you hear that, the more it reinforces it. And for me, that just encouraged me to get out there more. Very good. Thank you. Shannon? Um, I think that mine's an ongoing aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think I've kind of reached it yet. But it's kind of, um, it's it's a process, little bit, little steps, little ways, you know, that people might um, I just say they understand maybe. Um uh, it's not so much the affirmations because um, often, often with any kind of abuse victim, they don't get that, you know, we believe you. Often it's, um, well, from, from my childhood, no one believed me. Um, as an adult, my friends are fine. They've been supportive. But um, I suppose it's a bit like a, a gay person coming out, you know. <laughs> you kind of got this thing that you've hidden away for years and then you, you, you start to talk about it and then um, I'm just kind of waiting but it feels good but it's um also you know when when you and I did our interview you struck me because I had said in my first book that I had a PhD from the school of hard knocks and experience mm -hmm. and you said oh I don't view it that way I have a PhD from the school of the most fortunate because I'm here alive to say what mm -hmm. happened and that just that was so amazing because in you know, with the writing of this book, I've interviewed every one of you and each one of you that are, that are in this book that I interviewed before, you know, just in the beginning stages of this book, you've all taught me something. Every one of you, I've learned a more another piece of myself. It's been amazing. 
So it's just been very, thank you. But when those words, I've just, they have stuck with me so much and I so appreciate those words from you. Thank you. Janet. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cough. I'll get that out of my mouth. Um, I would say, um, honestly, my greatest aha moment was when I began to understand the idea of forgiveness um, and self-love. Um, I never realized until I went into the house how much I hated that little girl. I had so much anger in me at not only her, at my dad, at the other perpetrators. Um, and I, I didn't know how to let go of that. It was like, that's what kept me together was that, that anger and that hatred. And when I began to understand that forgiving, which by definition means letting go, um, was not condoning what happened. Um, it allowed me to let love and trust start to come back into my heart. And it gave me hope then that I could take something that was so horrible um, that happened to me and make it into something beautiful um, to help somebody else um, and, and make what happened purpose. So I think, you know, when I realized that, it was a big step um, in my healing. A big, beautiful step in your healing, yes. Yeah. Michelle. Wow. Um, as a rebellious little girl, because of what was going on in my life and being a runaway for many years and not knowing if people would believe me if I ever did tell, um, I think my greatest aha moment was when I was living with my mother. I may have been about 40 years old. I had just, um, I'm close to 60 now. This year I'll be 60. I'm bragging. Yes. I am too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I, right after writing the short bio for the college professor, um, I allowed my mother, I was always, I don't know, I had this fear of letting my mother know. I didn't know if she knew what was going on or not, but I had this fear that I could not tell her because like one of the other young ladies, domestic violence was definitely in my home. I mean, it was so prevalent in the home. You couldn't talk about it, but long story short, um, my mother, I was living with my mother and I let her read the book and I heard her crying. I heard her saying in the room, you son of a bitch, why you do it? As she's reading the book, excuse my language, and she's reading this book and I'm hearing her say that. She came out of the room and she just hugged me so tight, so tight and said, I am so sorry for not being there for you when you needed me. That was my aha. You know, I was able to let go of some of the anger at her because I never knew if she did and she um that that helped a lot it really did and I went on and finished that book and I, I cried through almost every page of the book um, and we became best of friends and I've learned to right now as some of the other the young ladies have said um I had so much anger in me I didn't know how to really love I knew what lust was I was very promiscuous but I didn't know what love is I love myself unconditionally as God loves me. He's taught me the process. He's continued to teach. I'm a, I'm a process at work, you know, we all love, are. you know, so he's teaching me and I'm ever so grateful that we have come together to do this project so that we can help others who are going through right now, you know, so they can realize that we are some women that have chosen to thrive. We are doing well in whatever we're doing in the walks of life. We have our difficulties, but we are no longer victims. We're not surviving. We are thriving. We, we are moved past this, and we're here because we want to help others. And I think that is each one of us' job in this world, our task, is to help others. Every job that I've done, J-O-B, that I've worked on, has always been helping other people, and I will continue to do so in every, for the rest of my life. That's beautiful. Thank you. And Cheryl Ann. There's been a couple of aha moments, but mm -hmm. I agree with Shannon. It's more of a process of ongoing, and you might not see them so clearly as aha moments until you look in the rearview mirror and go, oh, yeah, that was a big turning point. It's sort of been this uh, slow, well, not even slow, but just a transition that's not, um, not that tangible. But I think the aha moments when I look in the rearview mirror are 
One that really stands out for me is when I did confront, um, I met up with my father many, many years later to let him know who had hurt me and when it had happened and how it happened. And as you can imagine, how much it took to tell him. And he dismissed it as if there was a fly on his shoulder. And that was a big aha moment, not in the way perhaps you're thinking, but in the way that I realized, oh my gosh, okay, so this is my story. It's mine to tell in a way I need to tell it, and I need to know that not everybody wants to hear it, even if they need to hear it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first one. And perhaps more recently, and this is one I'm still processing, in fact, it was the night before you interviewed me, Becky, and so I was pretty out of sorts. I've told my story over and over again for many years, but I was out of sorts when you first spoke to me. And it was because I'd reconnected with a family member that I don't, didn't really know um, as I grew up, we had met, we spent time together when we were very young and then disconnected. And a family member, um, we connected through Facebook and they were able to tell me stories about myself I didn't remember. And of course, they didn't know I'd been sharing my story in the way I had. So they were naively just talking about our times as a young person. And for me, it was putting some more pieces of the puzzle together that um, I didn't know were missing. And when those pieces went together, a whole other area of my life come to an understanding. That was an aha moment I'm still working on, still processing, but it's sometimes those small little nuggets that get delivered to you, whether it's um, a trigger, a flash, somebody you're meeting, somebody else's story that relates, but it's those pieces that come together and suddenly your landscape, your portrait becomes brighter and clearer and more understandable. It's such an ongoing journey, isn't it? You know, it really is. And, and we want to acknowledge to those that are listening that for us, we've all, we're all spreading our message this way and it's public and it's out there. Um, and I work with people, a lot of us work with people to get that story and get it out there. Whether you actually publish it to the world, it's another thing. But that is a very strong consideration. And that is something that needs to be taken into consideration. If you're sharing your story, is it safe to share your story publicly? So it, just because we are to the place where we can share our stories publicly, if you just work on getting your story, even if you write it and never publish it, hide it somewhere, whatever, if it helps, if it can be a tool you use to get your story up there and out of there and out of, the other, out of being bottled up within you, it doesn't matter if it's published or not. What matters is that you're doing what it takes to heal. And as, as we can all attest for Cheryl Ann, her art was the the tool that she used. Maybe it's dance, maybe it's doodling, maybe it's, it could be any number of different things that we do that works for helping us to heal. Maybe writing is just not something you wanna do. Um, maybe it is dancing or maybe it is artwork. It, whatever it is, find what it is and use it. And so that's really, really, really important to, to think about. So our next question is if you had it all and we're closing in on our time and I have two more questions and they're both good questions. So kind of brief your answers up just a little bit. If you had to do it all over again, what would you have done differently? We'll start with you, Michelle. Very good question. Um, it's kind of hard to answer. If I had to do it all over again, um, I would start by not wanting to have been subjected to the abuse at all, but that's not my choice. But at the same time, being that I have been subjected to that abuse and the person that I am now today, I would not be that person had things been differently. So I, I appreciate life's lessons. I've grown through it, survived through it. I'm here and nobody can take it away from me. And I want to keep beautiful. giving up my time. Very beautiful. Cheryl Ann? I would have become an art therapist a lot longer, a lot <laughs> earlier. I think. I would have, as soon as I had the strength to recognize that art had saved my life. And when I say art, I don't mean beautiful high-end art. I mean a visual expression of what's going on inside us. I would have immediately put all my energies and finances in becoming to an art therapist 20 years ago. Don't if, miss if, if we only knew, huh? <laughs> Carmel? 
When I look back at the time it was happening, I, I realized there were people I could have told, they would have listened and they could have helped. So if I could go back and do it all again, perhaps I would reach out to those people and stop it from happening. Very good. Shannon? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it made me what I am today and um, I like what I am today. I'm very creative and I don't think I probably would have had that I don't know, that burn, that desire. I mean, I'm a workaholic, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's hard It's hard to say what I would change. I mean, you would change the abuse, yes, but it, we've all been made what we are today because of what we've been through. So, uh, so life is an experience, isn't it? Whether it's good yes, or bad. Yes, it is. Yeah, very good. Janet? Um, definitely I would have shared sooner. Um, it, it, I, I feel like the secrets and the shame just eat away inside of you until you feel like you're worthless and, you know, don't belong anywhere. Um, I call them shame attacks. I, I still get them. Um, I had one before this interview thinking, what am I doing here with all these other brave women? You know, I don't belong <laughs> here. And, you know, and that, and I think sharing is the beginning of the healing of that. And I, I would have done that a lot sooner. Very good. Shana? Yeah, I agree with the other ladies uh, as well. I, I, I wish I would have maybe told sooner, but I realized that wasn't part of my journey. I am the person that I am today because of my experiences. And I think I'm a lot better person in ways. I, I love who I am and I'm glad I'm in the place that I am. Yeah, I guess my only regret was that I wish I would have told or said something earlier, but I guess my soul wasn't ready for that. Right. We have to be ready. Absolutely. And, yeah. Nikki? You know, I honestly don't, don't like what happened to me. I don't condone it. Um, I don't wish it on anyone. You know, I don't like the domestic violence that was going on in our house. But looking back and understanding the situation, I know that we were all just trying to do, you know, the best that we could with what we had. And I know that I am who I am today because of what happened to me. Um, I know that I'm strong because of what happened to me. And I know that I, I really truly believe that I'm here to share my strength, to help other people because of my life. And I don't think I'd be half of the amazing, strong person that I am if it wouldn't have happened to me. Um, I, I do wish that I could go back in time and help to change the way that, you know, law enforcement handles things or, you know, those sort of things. But as far as what happened to me, I don't regret anything. You know, I, I, I could say that for myself too. I'm, I'm, I really love where I am right now. I love how far I've come. I love that I'm able to stand up and we're not standing in our story. We're standing on our story. I, the transformation in me and watching what myself, just me watching me going, wow, I like it. It really feels good. And so it's a wonderful place to be, but it's something that you have to be ready for. You know, you just, you just have to be ready for. And so we take the moments to, to savor the growth that we have made. So our last question for this interview is, what words of wisdom do you want to share with those who are just beginning to choose that to to start their healing journey what would you say and we'll start with you Charlene be gentle uh, be careful where you share make sure you're finding a professional you can work with not the professional that's necessarily available for you but seek out one find them find your advocates and find what works for you in the way to share so whether it's uh, as you would like to write down the story and then you can burn it, you can bury it, you can it, make marks on a page, um, use food and spread it around, whatever it is that you can safely take these complex feelings out from within you, take them apart, analyze them, put some back until they're ready to be worked on and the others start to release and break down. And the big thing is, is, yes, it's important to share our story without a doubt in the right place, in the right way. 
but sometimes it's important to go beyond the words because our narrative becomes just that, a narrative, and our vocabulary, as beautiful as it is, is limited, especially when we're dealing with such complex overlay of timelines and uh, experiences and emotions. So go beyond words. Thank you. Carmel? Uh, my advice would be follow your gut. If it feels like a good time to share, a good person to share with, go ahead. If it doesn't feel safe, then don't do it. And if you need a break from the healing, because the healing can be brutal at times. If you need a break from that, just step away from it. Just move away from it for a few days or however long it takes. So follow your gut. Very good. Thank you. Nikki? Um, take your time. You know, don't try to compare yourself with any other persons where they are. That's really easy to do. I've done it a lot. Definitely try to get with a trauma-informed therapist um, and a mentor, someone who's going to be good for you, who's going to be that person, that neutral person who you can go to. Um, and just be really, really gentle with yourself. That is key. You didn't get where you are in a day. <laughs> You're not going to get out of it in a day. It's a life journey. Um, and you're not going to understand yourself most of the time. So I think just to be gentle, compassionate towards yourself because you went through a life where probably no one was compassionate towards you, <laughs> you know. So try to surround yourself with good people, a really good therapist. Um, and spirituality, I think, has helped me tremendously. Um, and above all else, just remember to be kind. Try to go to that center place. I think yourself and showing compassion and love I think is really important. Thank you. Shauna? For my experience, do not give up. This, you know, the healing process, for me, it was a lot harder. <laughs> Once I actually broke my silence, I'll be honest, uh, to my mother and to a few others, it I actually, it was a lot harder for me <laughs> to start that journey. So for me, it was a lot harder, but it does get easier. And it does, there's so much to this journey, just don't give up. And like I said, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There really is. And it's like the young lady said before me, it's a, it's a lifetime journey. This isn't a process that's just gonna take a week or a month or even a year. As long as you stick with it, you will. And you, I promise you, you will find healing. You just got to stick with it. Do not give up. It's one of the hardest things that you will ever have to do in your life. But I promise, promise you it's worth it. There's nothing worse for me to think in this life that I would want to leave this life miserable, angry, and bitter, and living a life that was not for me because I was stuck in my own crap. Yeah. Healing, life is too short to be miserable. And my wish and why I'm here is to be a light for others who are still in that darkness. There Very is much. hope. Right. Thank you. Shannon? Um, yeah, uh, the old adage, one step at a time. <laughs> I think um, people, people need to take it slowly. They need to be kind to themselves. And if others are dismissive, um, they've just got to realise they're not ready to hear it. Don't push the point. Uh, and listen to other people's stories. And basically there's around the corner you don't know what's there and usually it's wonderful so look for the good thank you janet um i think um what i would say and what's helped me the most is to remember that you're not alone um surround yourself with people that care people that you feel safe with whether they're near or far um about a year ago I had a friend, a very dear friend, who after I had taken uh, a whole bottle of pills and was in the hospital, um, gave me a phone a friend card, day or night. And knowing that I had that probably saved my life more than once. Whether I used it or not, it was knowing that I wasn't alone. And I, I just want to say I have a, a small group of friends that have now become my family that I met at the Meadows, they save my life all the time. And the way they save my life is they're with me. I'm not alone. There's someone there. And that's what I would 
that that's what I would say to someone starting out to, to try to reach out where you can, because there's people that care. We care. Thank you. Not by yourself. Thank you, Janet. Michelle. What I want to say is, first of all, to all of those who are going through or have been through is learn to forgive yourself first. Know that you were not to blame for what happened to you. You know, love on yourself. Find, as the other ladies have said, find that caring, compassionate person. Be that caring, compassionate person. Um, know that you're going to have triggers. It's going to be triggers throughout your life. And you may have some setbacks, but you'll have somebody there, as Janet just mentioned, that can be your comfort zone, that can help you through those time trying times. Forgive that person who helped hurt you because in your forgiving of that person, you are releasing yourself. You're releasing, it will be such a relief off your, off of your shoulders, and you'll be able to fly and thrive in your life. Okay? Get the help that you need and be in love on you. Be compassionate, caring, just be yourself. That's what happened. Thank you. Thank you, all you ladies, for, for being here, for being co-authors in this book. One of the biggest messages that we have going out for anybody that it either right now is listening or at some time finds us um, through, because we're pretty heavy on social media and the, the word gets out, is that we're joining arms. We're joining hearts. We're joining together to be that source of inspiration to know that you are not alone and that we are here to support you and love you through it because that's what we need. It's, it's, it's quite a journey and it, there will be triggers. There are things that come along that just kind of knock us to the side from time to time. You know, we get up and dust our pants off and, and, and we still keep going. It takes time. It does take time, but know that you're not alone. We're all here together with you. And we hope that this has reached your heart and that, that you know that this journey that you're, you're starting out on or you're already on, that there is a lot of us that understand and that we're here for you. Thank you to each one of you for the, the great time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, ladies. We'll meet again Thank soon. You. Bye. Thank you.